This is the continuation part two of two of the first lecture slides. Um, there's just a few slides left that I'm going to go over. I believe in the last class, um, I stopped here on C2 prescriptions in Texas. And I'm gonna just briefly go over C2 prescriptions in Texas because they have a special rule that's a little different um, from most other states. And if you remember from introduction to pharmacy, um, you have two types of laws. You have your federal law and you have your state law. Nine out of 10 times, the federal law uh, is superior than the state law. It's the federal, think of the federal as the federal government. Um, that's the government that meets in the United States with the Senate and uh, the Congress. Um, most of the times, the laws they pass out state laws, but there's a specific rule, uh, and it applies to pharmacy law as well. A state can make a law that's more stringent, stringent means stricter than the federal law. And if that's the case, um, the stricter law goes into effect. So to give you a prime example, in the state of Colorado, um, marijuana is legal. It's legal to possess marijuana for medicinal use. However, federal law states that marijuana is illegal. So technically, if you live in Colorado, and someone had marijuana, a federal officer could actually um, arrest that person, even though it's legal in that state. Because remember, the federal officer is not uh, bound to a state law. A federal officer can travel all over the United States, and federally, marijuana is illegal. So if a federal officer pulled over somebody in Colorado and they had possession of marijuana, the person would, would say, hey, what are you talking about? Marijuana is legal in this state. But the federal officer says, could say, hey, I'm a federal officer um, and federally this drug is still illegal and could arrest the person or, or issue them a ticket. So the same thing applies in pharmacy. Um, in pharmacy, the way the rules are set up, uh, if a state has a more stricter law, that law goes into effect over federal. So with C2s, the federal law is basically this. C2s last, um, last six months, and they have no refills. But in Texas, they have their own law for C2s, which I'm going to go over. So Texas have very stringent laws pertaining to C2 prescriptions. Again, federal law states C2 prescriptions expire six months from the written date and can't have any refills. Um, a good way to remember in all 50 states, um, C2s never have refills, just in case they come up on the PTCB. No state has refills on C2s. That's just a federal law that all states follow. So even though the federal law states that C2 prescriptions expire six months after the written date, Texas has their own law which says C2s expire 21 dates from the original date and must be written on a special form. So since this law is more stricter than a federal law, the Texas law overrides the federal law because it's stricter. One is six months, this one is stricter, this one is 21 days. So um, the federal, uh, the, excuse me, the Texas law goes into effect over the federal law because it has way more stricter rules and also uh, Texas requires um, C2s to be on a specially written form. Other states, it's on the same form as all other prescriptions, but Texas, you got to have a special form to write C2s. And I'm going to go over this slide. So C2s in Texas must contain a controller ID number. Um, the controller ID number is written right here on the right side, bottom right barcode. Um, they also has a DPS number. DPS is Department of Public Safety. And I'll explain why they have these two numbers in a second. Um, something else Texas has, uh, these prescriptions, these C2 prescriptions, if we were in class, I usually bring old copies of, of uh, the C2 prescriptions to let you physically see the difference. 
they are extremely hard to uh, to duplicate. You have to have a state of the art um, copying machine to actually make a fake one of these. They're extremely hard to duplicate. Um, also, if you can see in the middle of it, this is a seal that if you hold up to the light, it shows up. Um, so this is another security uh, mechanism that the C2 prescriptions have. This is the Department of Public Safety uh, seal. It's basically a star with the letter uh, T-E-X-A-S for Texas um, written around each one of the points. So this shows up when you um, hold it up to the light. And again, they have these two barcodes. Um, you can't see on the back of it, but on the back of it, they have this watermark. Um, and when you rub on it, uh, it's a check mark, sort of like a pinkish or reddish check mark. And when you rub on the check mark, it actually disappears. And then in about 15, second le 15 seconds later, the check mark reappears. So again, that's very difficult to forge unless you have a very, very high tech um, copy machine at home. Um, so C2s in Texas must contain a control ID number, control ID number, which is here, um, a DEA number and a DPS number. So here's the doctor's DEA number. All controlled substances have to have those, and the DPS number. So uh, just in case a doctor's prescription pad for C2s were stolen. So just say a doctor noticed an inside job in his office, somebody stole his C2 prescription pads, and he's worried that that person would just start writing C2s all around the DFW area. Once the doctor notifies that his, uh, his C2 prescriptions pad has been stolen, the doctor can actually call in to either uh, the DPS or the DEA. They both have local offices in the DFW area report that his, his uh, prescription pads have been stolen. Doctors have a unique controller uh, ID number connected to their C2s. So the doctor just basically needs to give him his control ID number. And when you're actually in retail and you're typing in a prescription for a C2, you have to enter both of these numbers. Um, with today's technology, like CVS and Walgreens, at one time we had to physically type in these numbers, but they let it. They later they later added the bar the barcode, so now we just scan the barcode and the number automatically populates. But you still can manually uh, populate the number. But most texts will just scan the barcodes, the one at the top, then one at the bottom. Once you scan this barcode, uh, this number will all automatically populate. Once you scan this barcode, this number will automatically populate. Or you can do it the old way and just type in the numbers. So if the doctor has reported it to the uh, DEA office or the DPS, there will be an alert that will pop up on your screen basically telling you not to fill this prescription, that there's a hold on this prescription, that the doctor doesn't want any of these prescriptions filled. So that's another safety mechanism. Um, I do want you to know this, because this sometimes come up on the PTCB, this last sentence um, on page 31 or uh, slide 31, a doctor can only change the quantity and directions on a C2. They can't change the date or the drug. So um, let me just explain that really clear because sometimes it can be a little confusing. So if this was written out for Oxycontin 10 milligrams, one tab daily number 30, okay? And the person drops it off and uh, the, the person realizes that when they left the office, um, the doctor was supposed to put them on, uh, let's just say hydrocodone instead of oxycontin. Hydrocodone is, is a C2 now as well. So the person looks at the paper and says, oh, I don't know why the doctor wrote Oxycontin. Uh, the last time I had Oxycontin, I had allergic reaction. So he told me he was going to write this for hydrocodone. Now, let's just say that really happened and the doctor actually just made a mistake and wrote the prescription for Oxycontin instead of hydrocodone. You call the office to verify, speak to the doctor, and the doctor says, oh, yeah, I got tied up. That should be for hydrocodone, not Oxycontin. Um, 
Well, even though you got the doctor on the phone, you cannot cross out the hydrocodone, uh, excuse me, the Oxycontin and, and write hydrocodone on the top and, and leave a note saying doctor changed the medication, even though that's what legitimately happened. You can do that with any other medication, like a, you can do that with C3, C4, C5s, non-controlled medications. If the doctor made a mistake, you call the office and verify with the doctor, and he tells you to cross it out and, and change the drug. With C2s, you cannot do any, you, you can't change um, the drug or the date. So if the doctor was going to change to a different uh, drug, he would have to actually write a new prescription. Now you can actually e-scribe C2s, but um, a few years ago, you would have to physically, the patient would have to physically go back to the office and get a new one. And another thing that happens a lot of times is, remember, C2s last 21 days from the original date. And I'm explaining this in detail. So um, if this is November 6th, and the doctor wrote this uh, on November 6th, it expires 21 days, so that's November 27. Um, a lot of people who, who, to be honest with you, who get C2s, they make an honest, honest mistake. Uh, they're not used to um, medications expiring so soon. Uh, when C2s first hit Texas, uh, when uh, it used to be seven days and they moved it to 21 days, um, a lot of people forget about the 21-day expiration. And let's say they come back on November 30th. So it expired November 27th. If it was written November uh, 6th, 21 days is November 27th. So if the person brings this in and the date on the top is November 30th, it's expired. It's uh, three days expired. So sometimes, or I should say more times than often, the person gets frustrated. And one of the things they will say is, oh, could you call the doctor's office? I'm pretty sure he'll okay it if I get it filled today. Well, the thing is, you can call the doctor's office even if he okayed it. There's nothing you can do with it because Texas law states that doctors cannot change the date. If it expires, so sorry, but the person will have to get a new C2 prescription or the doctor can e scribe one. Um, but you cannot cross out the date and uh, change the date on any C2. So make sure you memorize um that the doctor can only change the quantity and the directions so if it was written once a day and the patient says oh he told me to take it twice a day you call and verify it you can make that alteration you can change the quantity so if, if the doctor originally wrote 30 on there and it's supposed to be 60 you verify with the doctor's office you can go ahead and make that change or you can change the, the directions once you have verified it with the doctor's office. So keep in mind, you can't just take the patient's word. You got to verify it with somebody in the doctor's office. And when you call the doctor's office, um, as a technician, you can do this. So if you're calling about a quantity or direction, you always want to get who you, who you talk to. Because sometimes you won't get the doctor, but you'll get his physician assistant or a nurse practitioner. Both of those can uh, validate for the doctor and can say, yes, the doctor says he wants to change the quantity to this amount or the directions to these new directions. Make sure you get the person's, uh, the typical thing we do is we get the person's first name, the first initial of their last name, and their title. Um, so if I was the, uh, the nurse, and I called it in, you spoke to me, and I said, yeah, the doctor authorized that change. Um, before I get off the phone, you will say, could I have your number, uh, your name, sir? And I will give my first name, which is General, and my last name is P-A, spelled P-E-A-Y. What you would do is uh, verify, you just put some kind of note, um, spoke to General, then P, and you're gonna ask me, what is my title before you get off the phone? Because I could be a physician assistant, I could be a nurse practitioner, and let's just say I'm I'm a PA, which is a uh, uh, physician assistant. So you put my title there, and then you just put the date. And the reason why you want to do this is because uh, during the final verification, when the pharmacist sees this, and he sees something being crossed out and changed, the pharmacist, if you didn't have anybody's name on there, 
the pharmacist is going to say, why did you cross this out and change the quantity or change the direction? And you say, oh, I spoke to somebody at the doctor's office. Well, the pharmacist is going to want to know uh, who you spoke to. So that's why you write it on the side. And also, uh, these prescriptions sometimes get audited by insurance companies. Um, and if they see change in directions or quantity, they want to know who authorized it. And so if you got the person's name and title, and also you want to put the date as well as when it happened. And you can put it anywhere to the side, as long as it's seen somewhere for verification reasons. Um, so I do want you to remember that a doctor can only change the quantity and directions on a C2. They cannot change the date or the drug. And one more thing with the date, if you notice here, on a C2, sometimes this happens. So let's say it's November 6th, right? You go to your office and the doctor wants to put you on Oxycontin, which is a powerful pain medication. Um, so just say it's me. I go to the doctor and he writes me a prescription for Oxycontin. So let's pretend it's November 6, 2020. So the, the doctor tells me, uh, Mr. PA, I'm gonna write you a prescription for Oxycontin, 30 milligrams. I want you to take one twice a day, number 60. But the doctor may say, I don't want you to start this medication until December 1st. So right down here where it says earliest fill date, um, the doctor fills out December 1st, 2020. So basically what this is saying, if they bring this to your prescription, this date here at the top is the date that the person went to the office. So let's pretend it's November 6, 2020. If the doctor fills out this date at the bottom, this is when the doctor, this is the earliest date you could fill it, okay? So basically I went to the doctor's office on November 6, 2020. This is uh, the one at the top right. This is the day I went into the office where the doctor originally wrote the prescription, but at the bottom is when the doctor actually wants me to fill it, the earliest fill date that he wants me to get this medication. And let's pretend he wrote December 1st, 2020. That means I cannot fill this until December 1st. So if this date is filled out, it always takes precedent over the date at the top. Sometimes you'll get them with just this date and nothing filled out here, so you just go by this date. But if you get it where the top date is filled out and the bottom date is filled out, always 100% of the time go with the earliest fill date, the date at the bottom, okay? Um, sometimes the person just thinks they can bring it in early, um, and if that happens, like, for example, if the person was to bring this in on November 6th and at the bottom it says December 1st, you just, you know, politely tell the person that um, the doctor doesn't want this filled until December 1st, 2020, which is the date at the bottom. Okay. Um, C3 through C5 prescriptions. So remember, only C2s need to be written on a special prescription form, which I just explained above. Again, wish we were uh, in class because I usually physically pass out legitimate C2 prescriptions um, that my old uh, friend who still works at the free, uh, retail pharmacist, pharmacist lets me borrow for, uh, for the class and return it to them um, so you can physically see them. But they look just like that. And they got sort of like an aqua green color. Um, so remember, only C2 two prescriptions um, can be written on special forms. C3 through C5 prescriptions can be written on any prescription blank uh, form, so they don't need a special form. Um, they can be written on the same prescriptions um, with not control, but most doctors usually if they're writing for a control prescription, um, they usually write the control medication by itself because they have to be filed separately. Um, so here's what this is talking about. Even with non-controlled medications, but the prescription must have the physician's DEA number. So remember, um, anything that's controlled, whether it's a C2, C3, C4, C5, must have a DEA number written on there. You cannot fill it unless the doctor, um, if he left it off, you have to call and manually put it on there. Um, that's federal law. However, when filing prescriptions, controlled medications must be filed separately from non-controlled prescription. So remember, when you get prescriptions, um, you got to actually file them. No different from when you go to the doctor's office. You probably don't see what's going on because you're not in the back. But um, 
when you go into the doctor's office, they have to keep records of everybody that was seen by that doctor or by the nurses. And everybody has to have their own file because doctor's offices get audited as well. Because if they didn't, you could easily defraud an insurance company. You could pretend somebody came and you gave them a certain expensive surgery when you actually really didn't do that. A lot of doctors that get in trouble for that, they just file um, fraudulent claims, claiming, uh, especially against Medicare, uh, that they gave a person this particular procedure, which nine out of 10 times is an expensive one, but that person never even showed up at the office on that day. You got to keep records of everything. And same thing with prescriptions. Um, you have to keep prescriptions and you have to keep them filed. And they actually filed in little folders that look just like what you see in your screen. And, and we, uh, in Texas, um, we file under what is called the California filing system. Now, some states, um, they file their C2s, they file everything together. Some states um, also file um, all the controlled substances together. So their files consist of C2, C3, C4, C5s, and then they have non controls So they just have two, file, two files, all the controls and then the non controls But Texas uh, goes under what they call the California filing system, because that was the first state to set it up this way. Um, under that uh, filing system, C2s are filed by themselves. And then you file C3, C4, C5s by themselves, or you file them in a group. So let me repeat that. So all so um, the California filing system is what Texas uses as well. So you got three set of files. One set of file has all the C2s. The second set of files have uh, all the C3, C4s, and C5s file, C5 filed together. And then uh, the third set has all the non-controls. Um, I kind of like that one. It's pretty easy to keep up with. As far as the way of filing, it's, it's very easy. Whenever you fill a new prescription, it's assigned a special number. So if you look here, whenever a prescription is typed in, it's assigned a special number in ascending order. So I, for example, a pharmacy opens for business. The first prescription as filed will be prescription number one. Second prescription is prescription number two. Third is um, prescription number three and so on and so on and so on. And usually after the prescription number, there's two numbers. They're usually zero, zero. Um, zero, zero would mean it is the original fill because sometimes doctors will put refills on there. And if a person had two refills, the prescription number would be one. And if they were picking up the second refill, it'll be dash zero, two. The, text, the second two digits lets you know it's the second refill of the original prescription. So that's what those two numbers usually look like. So next time you get a prescription field for the first time, if you look at the prescription number on the package, you should see a long number and then it should have a dash. And if it's your first time getting that medication, it will always be zero, zero. Zero, zero lets you know it's the original fill. Um, if they give you refills on that prescription and you fill it again, it'll have that same prescription number, but the zero zero will change to zero one, letting you know it's the first refill of that prescription. So that's how they assign. And um, one easy way to actually know uh, what type of prescription it is. So in Texas, pharmacies follow what is known as the California filing system, which means this. All C2 prescriptions, when it gets assigned its own prescription number, it will have the letter N in front of that prescription number. The N stands for a narcotic before the prescription number. So if you ever see a prescription number and it has the letter N, that means it's a narcotic or it means it's a C2, okay? If it is a C2, uh, C3 through a C5, um, they will have their own set of prescription number. And usually we file them in sets of 500, meaning we don't close the book until um, we have at least, we, uh, at least we have about 500 of those prescriptions and we close the book because C3s through C5s, um, 
they basically take a while to actually fill up, be honest with you, because more non-controls are filled than control medications. So if you just did them in sets of 100, it may be 10 prescriptions in that file. Um, C3s to C5s will always have the letter C in front of the prescription, uh, prescription number, letting you know it is a control medication. Yes, C2s are controlled medication, but since this is a special type, uh, they give the letter N as uh, a narcotic, letting you know it's the most serious type of medication. If it's a non-controlled medication, it'll just have the prescription number. It won't have anything in front of it, okay? And again, you can look at your prescriptions at home. Uh, it, it should be the same thing. Um, if you got any kind of prescriptions at home, if there's no letter in front of the number, uh, that lets you know it's a uh, non-controlled medication. If you see a C, like a C as in cat, in front of a prescription number, that lets you know it's a C3 through a C5. And if it's a N in front of your number, uh, your uh, prescription number, that lets you know it's a C2 or a narcotic. Um, and I don't know if any of you ever, if you guys get bored or whatever, you ever watch a show like Cops, or you ever reading the newspaper, um and the police pull over somebody and just say they find some drugs and they verify what the drug is okay sometimes you might hear the police officer say um well i'm gonna have to take you to jail because we found some pills in the car and um we have determined that these were uh, a, control, a controlled substance. That means what the police officer is basically saying is they found some medications and the medications are um, either uh, a, a C3, C4, or C5. So if, uh, if the police officer says, um, you, you gotta listen to the language of the police officer, if he says um, you're going to jail uh, for possession of controlled substance. So that means they found a C3, C4, or C5. Now, sometimes the police officer may arrest a person, they find medications, and they tell that person, um, I'm arresting you and taking you to jail for possessions of a narcotic. So what that should tell you, if you ever see that on TV or one of those shows like Cops, the police officer found C2s. Um, in the person's possession, okay? So if they just found controlled substance, they found C3, C4, or C5s. If they use the word, you're going to jail for possession of a narcotic, they found a C2, Adderall, Oxycontin, Ox uh, Oxycodone. Um, now, if they found um, something like um, a tenolol, but it wasn't in a prescription bottle with your name on it, more than likely, that's a ticket if they verify it. Just say they know it's a blood pressure medication. They could give you a ticket, but they call those possession of a, a dangerous substance. Um, but it's usually not a jail sentence, or usually they won't even take you to the uh, police office. They won't even take you to the uh, to jail unless you just had bottles and bottles of it, and it looks like you just stole that medication from somewhere. But if, if it was just a few pills, um, in a, in a bottle that didn't have your name on it and they verified it was blood pressure medication, they'll usually write you a ticket uh, for possession of a dangerous drug without a prescription or without identification. Um, one little thing before I leave this topic, make sure if you have parents or even of yourself and you take a controlled medication, just say you legitimately have a prescription for hydrocodone and you don't like carrying the big bottle with you that has your name on there, it's very important that you do because if you just, uh, for example, say, I'm got to go to work today and I know I got to take three of these today. So you just open up your bottle and you put three of those pills and you put them in your car or whatever because you know you have to take them. So you don't have the bottle with your name on there. And if you get pulled over and, um, the police officer see three pills on there and the police officer wants to know what they are. And 
they're just say they're hydrocodone you uh, you actually have a prescription for it at home and you got the bottle at home um you can get yourself in big trouble for that because the police officer is seeing three pills and he identifies them as a narcotic he more than likely is going to um take you to jail even though you got a legitimate prescription for it and you got the bottle at home um you're not supposed to be carrying those pills around loosely because if if they're in, in your pocket or they just in the glove department of your car um, and the police officer finds them and you cannot verify that that minute, like you cannot pull out your prescription bottle and show the police officer that you take these medications. Um, unless he's just in a very good mood and you, know, you can somehow verify it another way, normally a police officer would not go through that, especially if they didn't know you, but they're going to take you to jail for that. And then obviously you you'll get out of it a little bit later by verifying that you have the bottle at home. But uh, long story short, if you got controlled substance or any pills, make sure they have your name on there where you can identify it. Uh, when information is needed on a valid prescription. So basically just look over these, just read through these. Um, all of these must be on a valid prescription to make it legalized. And this is by the Texas Board of Pharmacy. This is almost always almost always universal in every state. Um, so you got to have the patient's name and address, um, name, strength, and quantity of the drug to be dispensed. The patient's uh, the address is is uh, mandatory on C tools only, um, but the patient's name obviously got to be on every prescription. Um, so just look at these and be familiar with um, what is actually needed on a valid prescription. And here it goes again with information is needed on a valid prescription. And these are numbered. So one, prescribe this information. Um, two, the doctor's signature or the DEA number if it's a controlled substance. This is written for semistatin 20, which is a cholesterol medication, it's not a controlled medication. Um, so basically, the DEA number is optional, really don't need it. Um, go through all of these so look at the numbers look where they position and um, know what is actually needed on a valid prescription okay and as far as the DEA number I know most of you are still learning the drugs the computer will alert you if it's a controlled substance because it will ask for the doctor DEA number if it's not a controlled uh, substance it wouldn't need a DEA number so until you know the medications the computer will help you out a little bit um, so again, be familiar with, with everything um, that's required on a valid prescription. And then the last set that I wanna talk about, uh, this applies to Texas only. So prescriptions from foreign countries. So in the state of Texas, we may only fill prescriptions that are from, um, the United States, obviously, but as far as the foreign countries, uh, Canada and Mexico, those are the only two foreign countries that we can fill prescriptions from. But there's a few criteria that must be met. As far as uh, in Texas, you will more than likely get prescriptions from Mexico since where we share the border, Texas and Mexico share a border. So it's obviously more um, likely you'll get a prescription from Mexico, especially we have a large Hispanic population from Mexico. Sometimes they travel there and they may pick up a medication or see a doctor in Mexico and return to the United States to get it filled. Um, Canada, again, we can fill prescriptions from Canada as well, but there's a, a few stipulations. The prescriptions cannot be a controlled medication. And this is a no brainer because um, Canada and Mexico do not have the same DEA department. So remember, all controlled substance um, must be registered. All doctors must be registered with the DEA if they are going to fill out um, controlled substance. But obviously, a doctor from Canada or Mexico uh, would not be affiliated with the DEA in the United States. So it cannot be a controlled medication. Um, it must be cash only or no discounts cards. Um, and the reason being is that the insurance companies will not cover, insurance companies in the United States will not cover doctors from Texas or, I mean, excuse me, doctors from Canada or Mexico because um, they wouldn't recognize those doctors. No MPI number, um, they just not registered 
with the insurance company. So it has to be cash only. And the prescription cannot be transferred. Um, so that means once it's filled at that particular pharmacy, it must stay at that pharmacy. And you got a little question here. Can a patient, can a pharmacist fill my prescription if it has been ordered by a doctor in another state or country? Um, yes, under certain conditions, another state, a prescription issued by a doctor licensed in another state, but not licensed in Texas may be filled in Texas if a true doctor patient relationship exists. Um, in the foreign country, that's the easy one, uh, has to be Mexico or Canada and no, um, no controlled substance. Um, and what I mean by a true doctor relationship, because this sometimes happens um, more often than you think. So you can live in Texas and have a brother that lives in California or a sister that lives in California or a mom and dad that lives in California that's a doctor. Just any other state except Texas. Just say you got a relative that's a doctor. And just say you get sick. And you don't have time to go to the local doctor in your area, the time or the money, either one. And you say, oh, well, my brother's a doctor and I'll just call him up and let him know what's going on. So you call up your brother who is a doctor in California. Remember, you live in Texas and you tell your doctor or you tell your relative, your brother, hey, I got a little sinus infection. Can you uh, I don't have time to go to the doctor over here. Can you just call in a uh, prescription to the CVS, you know, around my way. And your relative says, sure, I'll uh, call it in right now. Um, technically, if I'm a pharmacist and I get a call from a doctor in California that's calling in a prescription for his daughter, son, uh, sister, brother, uh, I can actually deny that prescription because um, if that doctor's in California and their relative is in Texas or another state, and you see where it says, um, uh, if a true doctor patient relationship exists, that's not a true doctor patient relationship. Um, that's just a hookup. You know, you got, you're fortunate enough to have a relative that is a medical doctor, um, and you have the luxury of calling them to call in prescriptions. A true doctor-patient relationship means that is your doctor that you see on a regular basis. They have records of you visiting that doctor. Not a, because uh, that, that violates a lot of um, ethics rule if you don't have to go and get exam and you just can call up your brother who's a doctor and he just calls in a prescription for you and never examines you. Um, that violates a lot of ethical issues. And if the pharmacist knows that or has proof that there's no doctor-patient relationship, the doc, uh, the pharmacist can deny that prescription. So I just want to let you know. And then finally, the patient database. If a person is dropping off a prescription for the first time in your pharmacy, there are crucial pieces of information you should always obtain from the customer. And then this is where we're going to end and the next information will pick up. What are some vital pieces of information that you may think you need to ask the patient? And we're going to actually pick up on that on the next topic. So this concludes part two of two. Again, if you have any questions, um, just remember I will be logged on November 6th um, from, oh, well, let's just say every Friday from, um, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Just go to Blackboard and look on your left and you'll see something that says a meeting. Um, just click on that and it, it'll show, it'll log you on. Again, it's optional. That's if you have any questions about any of the material that you went over. Thank you and have a good day.